Well, you know, welcome everybody to hashtag Be Nimble. Uh, this is our discussion on building African American museums. And I'm Eric Morcheski, the CEO of Nimble Strategies. Nimble Strategies, we work with small businesses and nonprofits and public private partnerships in an effort to really ensure that leadership and change management, our, our clients really see a streamlined process in a future for themselves. And especially in the trying times that we have going on today in the world, having a clear path forward is always a great thing to have. Uh, I'm really excited today. We have a great group of people to have a discussion with us. Um, joined with me every every broadcast is, is Dion Brown, our Managing Director of Nonprofit Services. Uh, Dion is not just uh, a great leader for our organization, but he's also a great friend here. And I think I think he can honestly say he's a great friend with Vedette and, and Dr. Bennett as well. Uh, so I think this is going to be a really fun and lively discussion. Dion, do you want to introduce our guests? Yeah, thanks, Eric. And as uh, Eric said, I'm Dion Brown, the Managing Director of Nonprofit Services with Nimble Strategies. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Vedette Coleman Robinson, who is our Executive Director of AAAM. Vedette came on board. Uh, back in 2019, she has just turned AAAM upside down in a positive way, and I'm so proud of the work that she's doing and leading us through it. Um, she just led us through our annual conference where we had to pivot due to COVID, and it was had to be one of the most successful events uh, that I've participated in since COVID, so uh, hats off to Vedette for that. Uh, prior to Vedette coming to AAAM, she worked for the National Park Service where she worked for 11 years as um, a grants management speci specialist within the state, tribal, local plans and grant division. During her time at the National Park Service, Vedette was the program lead for the historically black colleges and universities grant and the underrepresented community grant programs for STP, STLPG. Uh, she's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated has a Bachelor of Arts degree in U.S. History from Virginia State University, a Master's of Arts in U.S. History with a concentration in Public History from Howard University, and is currently pursuing her Ph.D. in U.S. History with a concentration in Public History focusing in African Americans and Public History at Howard University. Welcome to that. Thank you so much, Dion. Yes, ma'am. And last, but certainly not least, is my good friend, Dr. Dina Bennett. <clears throat> Dr. Bennett is the curatorial director. Is that right? Or are you the senior curatorial? Curatorial, curatorial director. Gotcha. Yeah. At the new, soon be opening National Museum of African American Music in Nashville. And it took me a while to understand this, but because I hired her at one point, which we may talk about later. She's an ethnomusicologist who specializes in African-American music and culture. Dr. Bennett has previously served as the associate director of the Mulvane Art Museum in Washington, at Washington University in Topeka, director of education at the B.B. King Museum and Delta Interpretive Center, and as the manager of collections at the exhibitions of, and exhibitions at the American Jazz Museum in Kansas City. Originally from Topeka, Dr. Bennett earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Studies from Washburn University, a master's degree in college student personnel from KSU, Kansas State University, and a PhD in Ethnomusicology with a minor in African American and African Diaspora Studies from Indiana University. Welcome, Dr. Bennett. Thank you so much, Dion. How did I do on ethnomusicologists? You did really well. <laughs> you passed. You know, before we get too far into things, Dr. Bennett, you have some exciting news that was announced last night for the National Museum of African American Music. I don't know if you want to share that with everyone. Sure, yeah, we are really excited to announce that we are going to open in 2021. Uh, our specific, uh, thank you, thank you. It's been a long time coming. This has been a project that has been more than 20 years in the making. And so January 18th, 2021, we're gonna have a ribbon cutting with our board members, staff, other dignitaries, elected officials. 
And then we're going to have a members preview weekend. So you can go to our, our website and you can become a member and I'll give you the website address in a few moments, but uh, we're going to have a members preview weekend on January 23rd and 24th, 2021. That's a Saturday and Sunday. And then the following week, we will actually be open to the public, which is January 30th. Right now, we're looking at doing tours uh, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. You can go to our website, which is, um, we call the museum NAMAM for short. So you can go to the museum website at NAMAM, N-M-A-A-M dot org, and you can purchase your ticket. So, or tickets and your memberships. So we're excited. Thank you. <laughs> I love the member preview. I think that's a great way to you know, really start to build sustainability into your organization. So, you know, to, to wh whomever came up with that idea, definitely a thumbs up choice. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you. Well, those those people are are special as as the public is as well. And we thank everyone for their support. And we couldn't have gotten here um, to this point if we hadn't had that that support. So Thank you. Because that was a good segue to one of my questions, actually. Dr. Bennett, you said that this has been around, the idea, the concept has been around for 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. I know with my experience in museums, it seems like African American museums is a, is a thought for such a long time. Uh, you said 20. The National Blues Museum here in St. Louis, it was around for the, the thought and the work towards getting it open. It was 15 years. The B.B. King Museum in Indianola, Mississippi, 10 to 12 years. It seems like it's, it's a lot. Of course, there's a lot of thought to one, but do you guys see anything? What do you think as you or for that is one outside of the funding? Why do you think it takes so long from the time the idea is conceptualized to at least breaking ground, I should say? Well, I think one of the things is that you have to sell it to the right people. Um, you think it would be easy to say, let's do a National Museum of African American Music and it all be said and done and everybody's running and wanting to be a part of it. However, um, not so. So, you know, I think that has to do with location. You know, where are you planning to have it? You know, that would figure into whether people buy into it and whether they think that it's feasible. Um, you have to also have to buy into, uh, will the public support it? Is it a good idea to have a museum? When this museum started, it was actually a museum that was focused on um, the arts and sports as well as music. And then after meetings and, and discussions, um, the common theme that kept coming up was music. So then the idea um, was changed and everybody pivoted to making it a national museum of music. So I think those are those are kind of some of my ideas around your question about uh, why it takes so long to to get an idea to fly. I th I think that uh, what Dina said is spot on. You have to sell it. Um, and then the other thing is just making sure that the community is interested. Um, the community might not want a museum in their neighborhood. Um, and, and not just that they don't want a museum in their neighborhood, they wanna make sure that they're connected to the neighborhood, to the you know museum. Um, and then the collections and all of that is just really uh, making sure that everything is uh, accurate um, and uh, making sure that the, the wall text and everything in the collection speaks to what the neighborhood wants. Um, but then on top of that, you know, through strategic partnerships and through strategic planning, as well as stakeholders meetings, just finding out where uh, the museum is going to be placed. Uh, as, Dina, as Dina said, you know, you can say, hey, I would like to plop this museum right here. I think it makes the most sense, but that might not even be what legislators want. So you also have to worry about, um, I don't know if Dina is allowed to say that, but I'll say it for her as an advocacy group. Um, you know, you have to figure out what the legislators want and what the state wants. And if it's a national museum, you know, you have to figure out where uh, though we're, you know, on national grounds, you're allowed to have it. So there's a lot that goes into place when, um, you know, conceptualizing um, a museum period, but especially an African-American museum, because you want to make sure that all of those pieces um, are right. 
uh, before you release it to the public? You know, uh, that, I, I agree wholeheartedly with both you and Dr. Bennett. Dr. Bennett, if I'm not mistaken, the location that the museum will open is not where you started out, where it started out, is it? No, it's not. Um, there were um, talks about having it on Jefferson Street, and Jefferson Street is the street in Nashville where uh, there was a large African American community, and there were many clubs, there were many businesses, you know, it was the heart of the, the African American community. So that's where we originally began. And where we have ended up is at Fifth and Broadway. And I don't know how many people are familiar with Nashville, but Broadway is the tourist district of Nashville where there's uh, clubs and, and restaurants. And so we're right on the corner. Um, across from Fifth Street is the Ryman Auditorium. And then on the Broadway side, we're right across from Bridgestone Arena, which is where the, uh, the professional hockey team plays. So we're at a really prime location um, and, and, you know, I think part of selling, um, us to, to Nashville, to, to other stakeholders is, you know, Nashville is known as Music City. So we want to be part of that because there is so much more to the Music City brand than just country music. I mean, if you go all the way back to the Fisk Jubilee Singers, you know, Fisk University here, which I'm happy to announce that our museum has a changing gallery space as well as our permanent exhibition, but our changing gallery space will feature an exhibit on the Fish Jubilee Singers. But that, that goes back to what you were saying, selling to the community. I think it's so important to have a part of your museum that's tied directly into the community. You're gonna get those tours, but you also have to have something that ties straight into the community to draw that local community. Who are your best marketers for your institution is by tying it into it. So I, I commend you all on doing that. Uh, but that, oh, go ahead, but that. Oh, I was just gonna say, and you know, when the tourists are gone, right? When tourist season is, is gone, yes. uh, it's always going to be the people in the community that are gonna continue to support that museum. Um, as long as they see themselves and everything, like I'm just trying to tell you, if it's done by design and on purpose, um, you know, you're always going to get that buy in from the community to say, hey, this is our space. This is our sacred space. Nobody can touch it. We see ourselves here. We're always going to be here in support. Yeah. And what's so interesting, and I think, Dion, you probably have another question, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Having worked at the American Jazz Museum in Kansas City, that is right in. Um, the 18th and Vine District. So Jefferson City is the, the, I mean, Jefferson Street is the street where in the community in Nashville, 18th and Vine is the street in the community um, in Kansas City. So there was a, um, I'm not sure if it's still there, but Parade Park Homes is, uh, was located right next door to the museum. And so, you know, it sits right in the community as does B.B. King. B.B. King Museum is right in the community of Indianola, Mississippi. So yeah, the community is key, definitely. Same with the Stax Museum. Mm -hmm. you know, there in Memphis also, the Stax Museum is right there in that historic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think where we have to do better as African-American museums is build up confidence in some of those neighborhoods yeah. because of attendance. Because if you put those institutions in the, in the tourist or no matter how much they want to see it, if they don't feel comfortable. And I think the Sachs Museum has done a, a crazy job because they have that, uh, was it the Sachs Foundations on the campus also? Uh, Soulsville Foundation. Oh, yes. And some and other things in the academy. Very well, very well done the way they did it. But I still hear different comments being said, well, in the years past where people, you know, safety at nighttime to go oh, to that institution. Mm -hmm. So how do you get your earned income from rentals you know, it's a, it's a problem that is a nice workable problem, I should say. But that, so what do you recommend though? Just like um, with memberships, uh, Dr. Benning, you may be able to talk about it, but as far as memberships with that, this is when we should really, uh, new museums when they're starting out should be building membership and excitement before the museum even opens its doors. You wanna to speak to that? Oh, absolutely. I think that uh, what Dina and her team um, well, 
the whole team at NAMAM uh, are doing. It's, it's just absolutely phenomenal. If nobody, if you haven't had a moment to just uh, check out Dion, I know, and Eric, I know that you've checked out their Facebook pages and their social media, but I mean, before ground was broken, it was the constant making sure that everyone was engaged. Um, from the time, I mean, the the one thing that spoke so so well to my heart is when you guys got the lease and Henry was holding up the keys and he was signing, you know, the the lease to the building. That's a way for everyone to feel connected. Um, and as you're building membership, I mean, membership is the 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 key role to making sure that everyone feels connected and can really have a buy-in and has a say in what the museum is doing. Um, I think one of the, the key things that we do at AAAM, when a member has an issue and they just wanna make sure that, uh, you know, programming is, uh, you know, relevant, they'll just bring it to us and say, you know, have you guys thought about doing this? And that goes into my queue immediately. Now, you know, some things we can't add everything. There's only, you know, 365 days in a year, uh, but everything is considered. And I've watched that uh, with what NAMAM is doing. Everything is considered. They make sure that when they um, put uh, some of the collections up, you know, we, we received this, this, this piece of the collection and it's gone in and Dina has done a wonderful job working, working with their marketing department um, and their social media department, just making sure that that information is out. And just about each one of our museums does that. Um, and especially during COVID, we really had no choice, right? Um, if you weren't nimble, that's why I always, I love you guys, uh, I, the name of your company. But if you weren't nimble, if you weren't thinking outside of the box, it was one of those things where you could remain stagnant um, and folks couldn't find you. Um, so, so you know, just making sure that you're staying in touch with your, your members um, and cultivating new membership and new relationships is really important as well. I think what you just said is so true, but that, I mean, I think we talk about the fundraising that goes into building these museums, but if you can't sustain mm -hmm. it, you know, we've, I've worked on numerous museums that have had to close their doors. And I mean, such a, that can be more devastating than maybe never having the project take off from the beginning. So building that sustaining effort into it and, and doing that from the onset and building that into the culture of the organization is so key. So. Yeah, I mean, I think NAMAM seems like they're doing a lot of the right things and I'm so excited seeing the photos. It just looks like it's gonna be a beautiful space and we can't wait for the time where, where Dion and I can make our trip out. <laughs> <laughs> just our, let me know when, just let me know when, yep. We'll have another laundry day. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Dr. Ben, Dr. Bennett, so without, I don't know who the, uh, designer was anything, but going back to the buildup and Bidette, you may be able to speak on this also with your history from the park service. When building out these institutions, I think it's imperative to have representation from a diverse rep representation from the community to make sure you're getting all input. Because what I've noticed in the three museums that I've worked in, the African-American museums I've worked in, the community actually felt left out. Mm. So with that being said, did Henry, did the team engage the community at the level the community think they should have been? Because a lot of times the community gonna feel like they should have had a bigger part than they did, but you know, they didn't put any uh, resources towards the project, but it's a, and it's a crazy balance. Uh, can either one of you speak to that? Well, I, I will attempt to speak to that. So um, I've been on the project for, it's about two and a half years now. And like I said, this project has been going on for a really long time, but I came along right when we started working with the designers and um, uh, was, was in on, on bringing the whole um, design plan to fruition and such. But I, I, I say all that to preface that I was not here in the early years, but I do hear that they did some community um, focus groups. Now, was that enough? I'm not sure. Um, I do know that once we pivoted to Fifth and Broadway from Jefferson, we had a lot of um, feedback. Mm -hmm. Some positive, some negative. Right. 
because I think a lot of people felt like we were leaving the community. You know, well, well we hadn't even been there yet. Right. You know, we were scheduled to be there. And I think they felt like we were, were changing, you know, or turning our backs on, on the community. So, um, and, and when I came on board, we were already, you know, Fifth and Broadway was already um, the place. So I don't know how those, that kind of feedback was addressed. Um, but um, the community, we are, we are very tied to, on Jefferson Street, there is a, a small house museum called Jefferson Street, I think it's Jefferson Street Sound Museum that is run by um, a, a, a man who is a wonderful friend of the museum. And we've done a lot of programming with him. And we've also been on um, various different uh, presentations with him as well. So we are definitely making the connection. And in the museum, we have a lot of um, attention turned towards musicians who were part of the Nashville scene. So we have definitely tried to incorporate the, the musical community of Nashville into our exhibition. And then of course, right now we're in the um, process of recruiting for docents and for volunteers. And of course, uh, we're looking to the community for uh, those persons. And what's fun is that our director of uh, education and public programs um, has decided to call our docents griots because griots are storytellers and it, it ties back into the whole African um, you know, history, so. That's, a, that's really amazing. Um, Dina, I mean, I feel like, uh, I mean, Dion would probably kill me if I said so, but it's like, you know, just I'll come for a little, you know, fellowship or something. Um, but I, <laughs> to answer your question, Dion, I think the thing that uh, is very important is just making sure that everyone has a, a seat at the table, right? Um, you want to make sure that uh, the community in which you're engaging has a seat at the table. Uh, so I, a lot of that just happens through stakeholders meetings. Uh, when but way in a different life, uh, before I started at the National Park Service, I, I worked for um, Lord Culture Resources where um, we traveled with um, Lonnie and his team um, and Free Lawn Bond uh, back then. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. back then it was Free Lawn Bond. So we traveled around the country really just doing stakeholders meetings to figure out what um, what the community nationwide wanted to see in that museum. Um, Lonnie was just very, very strategic. His, his team were very strategic in trying to make sure that that museum spoke to everyone across the land. It wasn't just going to be um, DC history, it was going to be the history of everyone from you know, coast to coast, um, pole to pole, uh, and just making sure that everyone was engaged. And the one thing that uh, he and Dr. Mack and so many people uh, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture did uh, were just to make sure that they did stakeholders meetings at uh, you know uh, professional organizations like AAAM and like Asala and like uh, you know so many other organizations just to make sure that there was a buy-in, um, make make sure that those you know everybody was very heard, uh, and we were walking away with tons and tons of papers of, you know, what people did not want to see, what people did want to see, and those things were implemented and they were executed excellently. Uh, so those are the types of things, you know, just making sure that people have a seat at the table. And then you have this whole thing uh, like charter memberships, right? Um, just out of that, folks were waiting for, you know, the National Museum to say, when are you going to when are you going to release these charter memberships because I want to be a charter member and that's what's happening with Dina's museum and so many of the museums um, across the land that you know are part of our uh, membership they're really just come in especially with COVID right uh, Dion to go back to one of the uh, questions that you asked earlier there are things that are happening on the ground right now that are absolutely so exciting folks don't have a space they're not thinking about opening up a space, but they are using social media. Um, I'm speaking to a few of our members who are just opening up new museums and they're like, Vidette, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, look, let's get you an e-commerce page. Let's get a website together. Uh, start 
shooting things out on Facebook and social media like crazy. So ask your board to like, you know, be part of your street team to just start sharing, sharing, sharing. Dion knows that very well. Every time I post something, I'm like, Dion, please share and tell your mama and your friend and everybody in your network to share as well because, you know, that's how you gain traction and that's how, you know, you have uh, so many eyes on what you're doing way before you can even open up the doors. And then that's when you can also start having uh, just tons and tons of stakeholders meetings, even virtually now, which are really important. I think you bring up a good point though. It's it, those stakeholder meetings don't stop when the museum opens. And I think that's a really good point of that programming that continues to engage your community moving forward, especially your local community. Although we see it on, on a national community level as well on certain events. Um, I think that's really still got to come from the input of the public around you. And, you know, Dion and I worked on when he was at the Blues Museum and I was at the Arch, Blues at the Arch together. And, you know, we, we continuously solicited feedback to try to make sure it was getting better and we were doing better things. That, you know, I still remember the first year we did it, the only negative comment we got was, you should give away free beer. <laughs> and I felt like we had really done a good job if that's the only negative comment someone that's could awesome. say. <laughs> you did an excellent job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, you hit it, Eric, uh, and Vedette, both of you, and Dina, you touched on it too. It, it's an ongoing process because I can honestly say at each institution, they had a reputation already within the community, regardless if they were already open or we were open. It already, because it had been around so long, people start getting preconceived thoughts. So not only do the programming, the stakeholder meetings, but it's you in the community so they can actually see a face to the organization, that helps tear down more walls than anything. Dr. Bennett will tell you in Indianola, Mississippi, the town is only 12,000 people, but of that, some of them didn't even know where the BB King Museum was at. And it's only a town with what, two stoplights? One stop sign? <laughs> I, it's very small. So we had to continually <laughs> do programming and be in the community and we tied it into other aspects, but that's so important that the work continues after the doors open. And, and that's true. Um, so this museum, of course, we're, we're going to open our doors in 2021, but I would say probably for at least maybe almost 10 years now, we have been a museum without walls yes. and we're offering programs in the schools. So our educator has been out um, making relationships, building um, partnerships with uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools. And um, so we're really excited. We have also been working on a curriculum as well. So yeah, definitely engaging um, the schools and, and the teachers and the educators for a number of years now. But that, uh, yeah, but that you had mentioned earlier that uh, a few minutes ago that other museums are contacting because it's a lot of stuff. I mean, what, what COVID has showed us is how virtual everything can be during these times and you can still raise funds while doing it. Absolutely. Um, we just had our AAAM Christmas party, which I thought was a huge success. And I was just surprised to see so many people enjoying themselves because it's a whole new way of partying, so to say. And you've put all three of them. So I would commend you and also demand of you to pass that on to our constituents because I'm sure they're watching how you're doing and there's a way for them to monetize that going forward. Oh, oh yeah, I've uh, shared with our members uh, just any nuggets that I have that have been successful for us. And you know, this is the time of trial and error. Nobody's gonna beat you up if two people show up to your event. You know, uh, in a time where you may have had uh, an event in a space and only two people showed up, you might feel a little, you know, uh, disappointed, um, you know, and then somebody will say, well, I have facilities here and, you know, I had to pay them overtime. But in this era of virtual, if two people show up, I mean, those two people will probably give you the most information um, because at that point they feel so much more engaged and being, you know, they don't have to clamor and you know, try to get your attention. They can actually just download everything and then you can have a second one. Um, so what, what I've been doing uh, a lot with AAAM is just trial and error, see if something works. Um, when we first started the virtual parties, <clears throat> my initial idea was just to 
allow us to have first Friday events. Um, I felt like our members needed something um, outside of, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our calls and um, just programming, just something to let their hair down um, in a way that was a little different. Um, so what I wound up doing, I, I contacted a, a DJ um, and he was, I mean, he's a celebrity DJ. He had everything set up. He said, all I have to do is just plug it in. And we went, I gave him our, our logo. He put it behind him. Um, and then I contact uh, people to sponsor us. Um, and then what, another thing that I did is we have a new membership stream, a new membership group. It's the uh, AAAM Emerging Museum Professionals. Um, and in that group, uh, museum professionals between three to five years um, in the field are you know, just blooming and blossoming so, so much. And one thing that I did, I just said, you know what? It would be great for them to get traction. Triple, we already have members. I want them to get all of the traction in the world and they actually love to party anyway. Um, some of us, you know, I'm gonna tell you, we had our conference and I, I think it was on th Thursday was when all of the members uh, showed up to our party. And, we, you know, so many of us were tapping out at eight o'clock already, but those emerging museum professionals kept going until, you know, the lights went off. So I said, I said, let's go ahead and let them have the first Friday events. Um, and it worked out very well. They were able to, um, in addition to having the first Friday parties, they also were spinning, you know, just, uh, had a spinoff and would do their programming from it. So they would either do it before a party or after a party. And it really worked out well. Um, and again, you know, there's been parties where, you know, uh, maybe 80 people have shown up. And then there's been parties where maybe 15 have shown up. And it, it doesn't even matter because we all still have a good time. But it's a way to connect your funders to something that's different. Um, just being able to say, hey, I'm having this event. It's a little different. I'm thinking outside of the box. How do you feel about, you know, having your logo in the background of a DJ booth? And I mean, you know, they usually say yes, because that's exposure that they wouldn't normally have. You know, I think the, the alternative to the idea that you may only get two people and that's still okay is you can reach so many different people than if it's a physical presence. And I think that's such a key mm -hmm. thing. You know, I've heard Dion talk about the concerts at the Blues Museum and how they were able to engage people from around the world to understand and know the Blues Museum was there and, and was putting on regular concerts. And those are people that, you know, if they're in France, they're not, they're not coming to the concert on a Friday night. I mean, you know, obviously our tourism bureau would love for them to do it, but, <laughs> but you know, the ability to reach beyond the people who may have been able, may not have been able to be there for whatever reason, whether it's location or time or, or whatever else, I think is such a key opportunity that I think the the world is openly engaging with a lot more right now because we were forced to, uh, we were slowly adopting it, and so. You know, Dr. Ben, I don't know if there's things that you guys see that you'll continue to do that have come out of all of this um, along those lines, or if there's, you know, new opportunities that you think may, may play a role in the future. Yeah, um, our uh, education and public programs director, she's been doing a lot of virtual programs uh, since COVID, and our numbers have uh, just really blown through the roof for that. And we're able to um, even um, reach other other artists to be our guests for some of these programs. You know, we have a thing every week called My Music Matters, where we we talk with an artist. Uh, last week, I think last week was Bobby Rush, and we did uh, <laughs> we did, uh, and I'm gonna mess her name up, which is horrible. Michelle in in Indichello. In Yes, um, so we did her one week, and and so it's 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 been really well uh, well received, and I think that some of those programs we will either do in person and virtual versions, or we'll just go totally to the virtual vir virtual version of it. So definitely has has helped us, and has helped to to continue to say we're coming, we're coming. You know, we're gonna open open soon. 
Dr. Bennett, what we found beneficial, as Eric gave the example, we had people from all over the country watching our live stream. We knew they couldn't be there, but it engaged them. And if it's possible, I would encourage you all to do the live, because you said you could do it virtual, to do it live and just stream it, because it's going to be people that everybody can't make it downtown and just keeps everybody connected. And the bigger sure. thing out of it that comes out of it is the wow factor. Look at my museum doing that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. and, and, it, and it keeps you on their mind. So if they do make a trip to the city, that's going to be the one place that's a must do because I got to be a part of it. We used to have people fly in from all over the country in the uh -huh. anyway, just to see a concert. They would come in wow. that night. My best story, and I see Casey is on this. She can attest to it. We had a couple leave on a Saturday, fly mm -hmm. from Alaska, fly eight or nine hours to St. Louis, see the concert. When the concert was over, got right back on the plane and flew back to Anchorage yeah, right. just to see Marquise Knox in person in that museum. That's and there's countless stories that we could, I could tell you about mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. I, I really encourage you out in all museums to live stream your events. It's not going to hurt your attendance at all. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like being seeing it in person, but if I can make it, at least I can view it and see the work you're doing. And we raise funds off of doing that also. We used to get $500 memberships off of those because people appreciate the work we did. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, that that virtual thing, Dina, um, and everyone um, who's on this call is just absolutely, it, right now it's just, it's needed, um, but you wind up, allowing so much more access to you that you know and then you can do fun things like um have different tiers of access um you know so maybe uh you know for that first half hour um you know or first hour folks can just hear you speak or hear you know leadership speak but then if they want to attend a concert you know you just allow them to do things a la carte and then for a full mm -hmm. package you know they can just go ahead and grab the whole thing um, I just attended uh, a Kenny Lattimore concert that was exactly that. <laughs> you okay. could get, I mean, and you know, Kenny Lattimore uh, was part of our, our conference. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we had a, a whole conference uh, during conference. He had a whole concert for us and it was absolutely amazing. And that was virtual as well, but we locked it down. So if somebody wanted to just join the concert um, mm -hmm. or have a package specifically for all of our um all of our receptions, um, they could do that. But for the most part, everybody was just like, well, why would I just do receptions when I wanna do the whole, um, the whole conference? Um, and then this conference, as Dion mentioned, this was our highest uh, attended conference ever in the history of AAAM. It was just really the access. Um, and then our membership has gone up 89% since mm -hmm. uh, last year. So it's we're just- <laughs> yeah. That's Thank the debt. You. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's just, you know, just being yeah. able to just think outside the box mm -hmm. and figure out ways. And, and you guys are the, like the National Museum of African American Music. Like nobody else has that. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. It's just yeah. Nobody else has it, important. but it's a hard thing to live up to. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was one thing I wanted yeah. to say. Remember who you are and live up to it and don't yes. try and be somebody else. Don't try and be the Grammy Museum. Don't try and yeah. be the uh, uh, Country uh, Hall of Fame. Yep. Be the National Museum of African American Museum yep. and you're going to be great. Yep, that's right. So, but then I got a question. For, oh, go ahead, Dr. Ben. I, I, I no, I, I was just going to say that's, that's interesting because when we talk about the museum, we have to remind people that we are not a... Uh, uh, Hall of Fame. You know, we get a lot of questions about a such and such in the museum and such and such in the museum, you know, and so we have to tell people our museum is about topics and issues and we have a storyline and narrative about the history of the music and where we introduce an artist is to um, show an example of that particular genre or how that genre has impacted the world. So that's been an interesting conversation too. Uh, but that so you were earlier you were talking about you uh, a couple museums opening the call and you asking what they could be doing or whatnot. Are are they running into any roadblocks? How what I, I'm not for sure which ones you're talking about, but at what stage of opening are they? Are they in the planning process, or are they just want to be virtual? Are they going to have brick and mortar or? So uh, these museums are in the planning process of their museum. So they they do plan on having bricks and mortar. Um, I can't share with you their names oh. yet because, and uh, you know, because they're like, 
please, right. you know, we don't want anybody else running around, you know, running away with this idea. And exactly. then, you know, they have millions and millions of dollars and then, you know, that mu- that that space is um, created. But uh, they, they do want to have space. They do want to have a location. Um, I am trying to guide, uh, there's at least five of them, trying to guide them in a way of, I understand that you want space, but there's so much that you can do right now that's totally virtual. Um, you know, there's international stuff that you can do that's totally virtual. Just the access that we have um, through Zoom. I mean, I always tell people, had I had known, I mean, I might not be the executive director of the Association of African American Museums, but had I had known, I would have put my little nuggets and my little ducats towards, uh, you know, um, some type yeah. of stock towards Zoom. But, um, you know, it's just it's just the idea of being able to uh, reach people. So what they're doing is they're starting, um, they have their website. I told them, make everything forward facing really, really fast. Um, have a donation box, have charter membership out there for folks to already engage, start doing your programming, start thinking about your partnerships that you want to have now. Um, you don't have to wait until, you know, as long, I mean, as long as you have your, um, your nonprofit status, there are so many things that you can do right now, as far as partnerships are concerned, um, you know, in, in the local communities, um, as, as well as stakeholders meetings. So there's, there's, tons of stuff that they're thinking about. And then there's also e-commerce that they can do. Um, they, I have one mu- one of our museums, um, they're making a patch um, because they want people to, you know, walk around with the patch and iron it on. Uh, there's another museum's uh, doing the the crock giblets. Um, they're the, you know, the, the accessories for crocs, uh, the shoes crocs. So Ooh. they're they're working on those. Um, <laughs> another one, they're doing the, um, the pop, I don't, pop sockets that go on the back of the phones. There's just all types of things. And I'm like, well, just, you know, do a mask, but you know, everybody's yeah. doing masks right now. But, you know, there's so many things that, uh, you know, folks are just thinking outside of the box. I never would have thought to have a crop giblet, but um, it's out there and it's one of the things. So <laughs> one of the things that they're using for e-commerce, so it, it works. Hey, Eric, this is more directed at you. From your experience, what do you see as some of the pitfalls that up and coming museums make? You know, I think we kind of touched on it a little bit in, in yesterday on, on our, our prep call. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting, Dr. Bennett was saying the exhibit design team not having African Americans on the team. And so there was an educational piece that had to go into the design team not from the design perspective, but from understanding the perspective of, of what was being represented. And, and I think that was a really kind of, to me, that stood out probably more than anything else on, on our discussion. Um, I think the ability to engage and understand and represent the community that you're trying to portray through your museum. And that, that would go, you know, whether it was the National Museum of African American Music, or whether it is, you know, a museum towards Cuban heritage down in Miami, or wherever that might be, like, you need to understand and represent and embrace the story that you're telling. And I think that's so important. I remember years ago, um, the creative director at, at our firm was talking about museum design changed from the 70s, the 60s, where it was throw out some artifacts and tell tell people what they're looking at to, we're gonna tell a story and you're gonna walk through and read that story and you're not even gonna know you're reading a story, right? It's not, it's not a story like, uh, like you open a book, but what story do you wanna tell? How do you wanna tell it? But then engaging the right community means you have the right voice telling that story, I think. And, and so I think that's a really kind of, interesting way to think about it is how you engage your community and then obviously and Vidette touched on it a little bit funding becomes so fundamental towards all of it and and then you start to create a balance right of what does the community tell you and what does the funding tell you because they never perfectly align (laughs) unless there's only one person writing every check and and then maybe you do but even then you probably don't Um, that that becomes a really really 
tough issue for for anyone to play when they're starting to build a new museum is is what rope do they walk and how do they balance all of that together um, and especially in a in a space where you're probably dealing with it at, at the National Museum of African American Music of there's probably state and city dollars in it there's probably private dollars in it there's communities you're representing and you're talking national now right so there's a local community saying talk more Nashville there's a national community saying no this is national and then you've got the donor community and the in the the tourism community all telling you a different story and you've got to weave all those together to to make the right approach so that you can be successful and that, that's a lot of work right um yes <laughs> uh, indeed i remember here at the national blues museum people we made a room specifically for st louis that was by choice that we put that in there but people used to come up and say well where's st louis where's st louis i said it's in missouri we're the national blues museum we're not now i wouldn't say it on a microphone thing but if i was <laughs> one-on-one -on -one with somebody, that's what I'd say, because it's a fine, as Eric was just alluding to, it's a fine line because you have so many stakeholders, but you have to remember you are the National Museum. And uh, what Eric was saying, with, and Dina, you touched on it also yesterday, mm -hmm. about these designers, and especially when it takes so long for these projects to come to fruition, sometimes the designer, all of a sudden they own it and forget that we're the customers, we're the one with the voice with the story. So. That's one of the pitfalls I find is that it becomes that creep on who's owning this. And you're, you've been involved, so you could be involved for the last two years, but they've been around for 15 years. And so the story could get lost in what you as a curator, or you as an educator, you as a museum really want it to be. And what's so great about that, that's so true, is that early on we assembled a storyline committee of scholars around the country who have specialties in all these different genres and brought them to the table. And so out of that, we uh, developed our storyline in our narrative. And then we brought in uh, Dr. John Fleming, yep. who is known in uh, the museum world to be our director in residence. And then we brought Dr. Portia Maltzby in, who is a renowned ethnomusicologist to be our lead scholar. And they have been with the project for at least the last 10 years. So even though I haven't been here, they have been in my stead and have been able to make sure that we are telling our own story and telling it the way that it needs to be told. So we, we're really excited about that as well. Uh, one thing that we have, um, one, a, a subcommittee of our board is a music industry relations collective. So we are definitely bringing in the music industry to be a part of our experience. So myself and Dr. Stephen Lewis, the curator, uh, we just finished giving like a three week series <laughs> of walking the music relations collective uh, through the galleries. So once again, talking about all the topics and issues and how we're laid out. So I approached Henry, our CEO, and told him I think that it would be great if Dr. Lewis and I do that for the staff so that the staff is just assured that we're all telling the same story. And, and what this museum, you know, the staff is busy doing their other things. The other things they're doing, marketing, development, education, but, and they hear about what we're doing in curatorial, but we want to make sure that we take them through and they ask any questions they may have, because they're all, they will also be storytellers and representatives for the museum, of course. So. Uh, the dead, for, I see the time we're starting to get close, and I know Eric want to open up for questions if we have some, but can you please tell, one, what AAAM offers new startups or new museums once they become members, what we do for the field. Oh yeah, so uh, something that I've kind of just said, we, we just need to do this. Um, and then the board has just been so, uh, I'm not saying that because both <laughs> Dina and Dion are on the call, um, but <laughs> the board has just been <laughs> so supportive, uh, you know, before I even came, Triple AM has been around for 42 years, right? Um, we're going to be 43 years in um, February. But the the thing that is always so appealing to me about Triple AM is we really are a family. Um, we make sure that 
if you have a concept, if you have an idea for a museum that, uh, you know, you're, you're tapping into so many people who have already done this work. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, now, if you're being stubborn and you want to reinvent the wheel, fine, that, you know, I'll allow you to do it. The board will allow you to do it. The ancestors will allow you to do it, but you don't have to. Um, you can come to us, you can come to us with your ideas. You can say, you know, I'm wondering if this will work, if that will work. You know, we've had some, some uh, folks who have said that they're gonna open up museums in two years. And, you know, that's very ambitious and I go with it. Yeah. I allow them to um, go along with that idea because I'm mm -hmm. not going to tell them that they can't. Um, but uh, it's, I mean, the National Museum was how many years in the making, Dion? I mean, our our, uh, a lot of our founders and charter members really were advocating for that National Museum of African American History and Culture to open up in DC, um, at least for 40 years before it did. So mm -hmm. yeah, everybody, everybody and their mother, their aunts, their ancestors were a part of that advocacy work. Um, so uh, what we continue to do is just making sure that um, as new museums come into the fold, and, and museums, you know, who have been around for forever, um, who just need to reconnect. They found they've lost their way somewhere along the line and they need to start realigning with the community in which they serve, but then also the national community. Um, we, we just really make sure that we support and advocate for you. Um, and it, it was funny because before we started, uh, Eric said to Dina, yeah, I received a press release. And I said, I received the press release too, but I need that. I need it in Facebook format so I can share it. So that's something else we do. We just make sure that we elevate all of our members um, as things are happening. Um, now, everything has to be placed in queue because you know we're 365 days and um, over uh, almost 800 members now. So you know we have to kind of uh, slice and dice how we put information out. But we do elevate everyone and just make sure that you you know you're able to put that best foot forward. I will have to say, sorry to chime in here, but it's hard to keep up with everything you share. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Yeah. That so itself is a full-time job. So. <laughs> so let alone getting in to read it all, but just keeping up with everything you share. I was trying to find something the other day. It took me a while, but. Yeah, yes. just at that point, just text Dion because he has it. <laughs> right. <laughs> But, you know, I, to Dion's point, we did get at least one question so far. And anyone else, please feel free. There's a, there should be a Q&A section on uh, your screen that you can write in any questions you would like asked. But, you know, how can we do a better job of engaging the youth for, for these museums? And I think, you know, what, one of the things I always say, I guess I have two, sorry, but you know, anything you do for me is great. Anything you do for my child is going to be a million times better. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when these when these museums, they take they go out of their way to to create programming or do something special, like Dr. Benning, you were talking about before opening the education team getting out into the schools. Like, I think that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's that has so much more of an impact. And I will call that almost a universal truth. And, and what I what I mean by that is I, we've des I've designed museums around the world, or I, I can't draw you a picture, but people I've worked with design museums around the world, and, and I wrote their contracts. And um, okay. <laughs> but it was whether I was in China, whether I was you know dealing with someone in Israel, the impact of the family and what you're doing for the children is so incredibly important, and. And I, I think that's, you know, sometimes lost because we, you know, if you're a fundraiser, you're a lot of times going to someone who's 60 plus because they have the money. <laughs> but, you know, that has such a long term impact and it's harder to necessarily weigh the initial gain out of it uh, because you may not see that funding right away like you would if you're going out and dealing with a 65 or 70 year old person who can just pull a check out and write it. But I think it's such an incredible thing to think about is, is making that lifelong impact. Um, you know, I mean, you never know whether you're gonna turn out the next, you know, great blues musician because, you know, you put on the right programming at the Blues Museum, the National Blues Museum, I should say, <laughs> um, or, or whatever that might be. But I think that's, 
the next ethnomusicologist. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Eric, you, you hit it. And it's so important because even though that's not fundraising, so to say, those kids become a piece of collateral for you. We yeah. and uh, Dr. Bennett was there. We had the BB King Bridge Building Ambassadors. That program is still going on, where it's competitive to even get into the program. And you never know. And those kids, they still bond together. We did the mm -hmm. um, here at the National Blues Museum. We put in a, a a kids band, formed a kids band that would play. So mm -hmm. you never, like you say, Eric, you never know. And what we did, we weren't using the kids, but that was a collateral piece that we can go to potential donors and say, "This is how we're impacting the community." Right. So, Dr. Bennett? Yeah, yeah, we had, and so the B.B. King Bridge Building Ambassadors was a teen docent program, and of course, we're talking about young people that actually live, you know, where the museum is, uh, but we were able to uh, bring youth together and give them training on how to be leaders and how to give museum tours. It was a program that was under the uh, umbrella of the United States Holocaust Museum up in DC. And um, so, yeah, involving youth is, is many times their first introduction to the arts is through some of these programs that are offered by museums and cultural centers. I know that's the case for me, you know, and what where I'm at today is because of an arts program that I was in when I was younger. Um, and at the Jazz Museum, they do something called jazz storytelling in the atrium. You know, you walk in and there's a visitor center. To the left is the Jazz Museum. To the right is the Negro League Baseball Museum. But there's a huge atrium area. So you have a jazz vocalist. She has a bass player and a drummer, and they do jazz storytelling. Um, of course, that was pre-COVID. I think they're doing virtual jazz storytelling now. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we have to we have to encourage youth, but also the family. You know, mm -hmm. with the buy-in from the parents too. So they'll bring the kids or or. Uh, That's what we use to get the parents to even come is by doing concerts with kids and get the kids in there. Parents to come in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we actually put them to work. We gave them jobs because in. Unfortunately, in Mississippi, the jobs are scarce. And so we would give them six to eight week little stints at a job. Yeah, the young people, right? Yeah, yeah who were in the program. That's right, Dion. Yeah. Well, I gave Dr. Bennett a six week job, you know, and then she left. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get you one time, Doc. Uh, okay, well, let's have another session where I can. <laughs> can okay, can you see about scheduling that one? All right, yes, ma'am. Okay. But that, I don't know, are you seeing anything else that's really, you know, helping with youth engagement across? Oh, yeah. I mean, you made a, a very valid point. I, I had a friend one day who said to me, um, and it stuck with me forever, before I had my son and before I was even married, she said, you know, I mean, it's nice that you buy me stuff, but it would be great if you did something for my kid. And I was like, oh, another gift. Okay. <laughs> I was kind of taken aback. But what she was saying in that moment is she didn't need anything. But uh -huh. if I wanted to show my love, I need to show show my love to her through her child. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I implemented that and I, it stuck with me. So what I've noticed that our museums do um, is really just engage uh, youth through youth programs galore. Um, something that I think is really, really interesting is I the Northwest African American Museum in Seattle, they, they do this thing called a uh, young scholar curators. I mean, it's really for the local community, but because of COVID, they're actually, you know, opening it up for other artists. So I uh, sent a quick picture of something my son did and, you know, it may or may not, you know, he may or may not make his curatorial debut. I don't know. <laughs> I would love to see his, his artwork um, in Seattle. He actually asked me the That's other day great. if he thought, do you think I'm going to be famous? And I already knew he's going to be famous with or without this piece going into the museum. But it's just it's just really, really great. And then before I came here, the Park Service has junior ranger programs. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely something that can be, I mean, it opens up these children to visiting national parks, right? So all, although those are um, spaces, you also have to remember that the National Park Service has um, sites. And within these sites, those sites are actually museums. And we have tons of them that are members um, because they're, you know, want to know that what's on the cutting edge of making sure that their museums are uh, always up to par. Um, 
So, you know, and, and some of our museums are doing the same thing. Obviously, it's not called a junior ranger program, but um, just engaging the youth um, and they're doing virtual, uh, virtual things as well. The Reginald F. Lewis Museum um, of Maryland African American History and Culture just recently uh, had a, they had an exhibit about uh, black comics and they wound up having a virtual, um, a virtual uh, drawing class for the students to learn how to uh, draw comics. So it was really, it was really neat. And there, there are things that all of our museums are doing um, across the land. And I'm not going to continue to speak because then I'm going to get emails like, oh, you missed what I was doing too. <laughs> so no more name dropping, right. no more, you know, no more highlights. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll do it on, I'll do it on social media, but, uh, you know, everybody's just doing amazing things. I can't, I could not be prouder of what our, what our members are doing. Well, I think you brought something up in there that I think was a really great point to it all is that partnerships, not trying to do it on your own is such a, a great way. I mean, donors are almost demanding it amongst nonprofits at this point of, you know, you're, you're doing this over here and they're doing this over here and you guys need to combine. You're gonna give the same amount of money, but you're gonna do it together. Um, but, you know, it's such a great way. We, I was having discussion with a, a national sporting body a few months ago and they were talking about engaging the African-American community and in their sport and I was saying don't try to recreate this yourselves like you have boys and girls clubs across the country that would love to partner with with groups mm -hmm. that have mm -hmm. you know a great audience to it and, and you should never be trying to create something yourself if someone else has already done it better <laughs> um, you know it, it, and there's no way to just say this community is mine tomorrow it, you need to organically create that and one great way to organically create it is partnerships. I don't know, Dr. Bennett, Dion, you know, any of you, I mean, some of the partnerships you've seen that have, have helped that, love to hear kind of what you're seeing and doing. Oh, I can, I can speak briefly. Oh, is that a question? Okay, I'm sorry. That's a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bennett mentioned one of them. We partnered with the Holocaust, U.S. Holocaust Museum. We used to partner with the Jazz St. Louis here in town uh, when I was at the National Blues Museum. Cincinnati, we partnered with every organization and not just to include the uh, police department, the downtown police department, uh, youth groups, boys and girls club. We just partnered with everybody because everybody brought something to the table. Either we had the space and they had the talent or vice versa and it just built partnerships. And for a museum, it just lets the world know that one of your partner, you're approachable, your partner and you're trying to make an impact in the community which helps brings dollars. Yep. Uh, right now one of our uh, really uh, important partnerships is with Vanderbilt University. We have a partnership series on uh, a faculty lecture series so we can share speakers to come in and then also we are sharing an artifact collection um, partnership so they're going to help us to build up our collection. So we're excited about that. They're just down the street, so. And, and on, the, on the national, international level as an association, um, one of our major uh, collaborators is the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Uh, we did, t like I said, we did tons of advocacy work to make sure that uh, the museum um, was up and running, but then also, you know, it, it also uh, is recipro reciprocal. So they continue to make sure that uh, museums across the land through AAAM um, have what they need um, and really listen to us. So they have a, a, a program for board training. They have a program for um, emerging leaders, just any and everything that you can think of. Um, and then things that I kind of I'm like, hey, I think we need this too. Um, we're, we're really just uh, together working on that. And then we have uh, some more, uh, you know, uh, associations that we collaborate with, like uh, the American Alliance of Museums and um, ASALA, which is uh, the oldest African-American um, organization that supports African-American history and culture. It was founded by Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I'm not gonna have anybody call me and yell at me about that, <laughs> um, especially with Black History Month coming up and then his birthday is coming up as well. And then we have tons of partnerships. I, I'll 
I'll make sure that Eric has the links because I don't want, again, I am, I am, you know, on that thin line of being yelled at uh, for not shouting everyone out. But um, one of our major collaborators, uh, in addition to those uh, three, I think that I've listed, um, is the National Council on Public History. They are just mm -hmm. amazing, amazing, amazing partners. Um, we had uh, about three years ago, a, a book that was published through um, then a, a volume on the state of African American history and culture, and it was just pushed out, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and this is, of course, before I came on as ED, but uh, I was a member at the time, and I was so happy to have that book, and I wish I had it in front of me, but you'll see it on the website. It's all over the place. Um, I make sure that we push it out because the content is absolutely so amazing. Um, Dr. Fleming, who I, Dina mentioned earlier, um, contributed to that book as well as Dr. Mack and so many people in our field. And we're just so thankful um, for that. And I see Eric uh, pacing back and forth and looking at the time. I think we might be over time or right on time. So I'm going to zip it. But thank I, uh, you. I, I was, Dion was texting me saying, you know, get with the program. So, <laughs> but you know, I, I think, thank you so much. Is there anything parting kind of comment note that you would like to leave anyone with, you know, become a member at National Museum of American uh, African American Music and and join us on in mid definitely <laughs> yeah you know, all of our um our as I said our website is nmaam.org and all of our social platforms we can be found at the name am nmaam uh so we uh hope you'll look for our virtual programs and that you'll take note of our public opening uh, November thirtieth. Um, and we'll, we'll see you soon. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, and because two of my bosses are on this call, uh, please definitely um, think about and really consider a membership with AAAM. Um, our uh, website domain is Black Museums, that's plural, .org. If you do a search for AAAM, something like the American, something automobile pops up, and that's not us. So uh, blackmuseums.org on all social media at outlets as well. Um, we're, we're here, we're here to support um, and just also look out for all of the all of the uplifting that we do for our members, um, as well as the professional development um, sessions that we'll have for members as well. A lot of things that we do are for members and by members um, so that you know everyone is just being elevated. Uh, so thank you. And I look forward to seeing, look forward to meeting you soon. I'd, I'd like to get last shot in to Vedette and Dr. Ben. Thank you to superstars of the field for joining us today. Vedette, what you're doing at AAAM, kudos to you. You are a rock star taking us so high. We, we, you, you were thank a great hire. Thank, you. Dr. thank ben, you. Doc, you're more than welcome. Dr. Ben, it's always great to see you. The work that you continue to do, you're a trailblazer in the work that you do, and you keep on spreading that knowledge. Thank you and good luck down there in Nashville. Hope to see you. Won't be there November 30th, but I'll Thank be there post-COVID. Uh, okay, I understand. <laughs> and I appreciate it. And I'll give uh, one little pitch. So our, our next show will be on January 12th. And it is focusing on architecture's effects on cultural attraction. So it should be a really fun and interesting, engaging talk. Uh, Michael Freebly, who is an architect at Callison RTKL, and on this call right now, so I felt the need to, <laughs> to give him a, a little shout out, but he will be one of our speakers. Really exciting. I mean, if you think about all these great museums that we just talked about, you know, I, I like to say, is it is it what what is it what's on the inside that counts, or does the building itself? How much of an impact does that play on? on the value of the space. And so I think we'll, we'll get into some fun topics. So thank you all, you know, have a great day. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.